It was a cold winter's morning on the island of Sodor. The wind was bitter and the ground hard with frost. Thomas and Percy were cold and cross. All I want is a warm boiler, huffed Thomas. Firelighter knows that. He's late. He's not late, replied Percy. This weather woke us up early. Gusts of wind swirled round the shed, tossing flakes of snow toward Thomas. Then they swooshed round Percy, too. Why don't we talk about something else, shivered Percy. Yes, replied Thomas, like how silly we'll look when our funnels turn into icicles. That's not funny. Maybe we'll stop feeling cold if we talk about warm things, like sunshine and steam. And firelighters, muttered Thomas. Scarves, continued Percy. Scarves, laughed Thomas. That's what you need, Percy, a woolly scarf round your funnel. Thomas was only teasing, but Percy thought happily about scarves until the firelighter came. Sir Topham Hatt was enjoying hot porridge for breakfast. He was looking forward to taking important visitors on a tour of the railway and had pressed his special trousers. I shall put them in my trunk, Sir Topham Hatt said to his wife, and change into them just before the photographs are taken. Then he set off to catch his train. Percy was now working hard. His fire was burning nicely, and he had plenty of steam, but he still thought about scarves. He saw them everywhere he went. My funnel's cold, my funnel's cold, he puffed. I want a scarf, I want a scarf. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. Engines don't wear scarves. Engines with proper funnels do, replied Percy. You've only got a small one. Before Henry could answer, Percy puffed away. Henry snorted. He was looking forward to pulling the special train. It was time for the photographs. Everyone was excited. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting on the platform for his trousers. They were in a trunk amongst a big load of baggage. The porters were taking the baggage trolley across the line. They were walking backwards to see that nothing fell off. Percy was still being cheeky. His driver always shut off steam just outside the station. Percy wanted to surprise the coaches by coming in as quietly as he could. But the porters didn't hear him either. Percy gave them such a fright that boxes and bags burst everywhere. Oh, groaned Percy. Sticky streams of jam trickled down Percy's face. A top hat hung on his lamp iron. Worst of all, a pair of trousers coiled lovingly around his funnel. Everyone was very angry. Sir Topham Hatt seized the top hat. Mine, he said. Percy, look at this. Yes, sir, I am, sir. My best trousers, too. Yes, sir, please, sir. We must pay the passengers for their spoiled clothes, and my trousers are ruined. I hope this will teach you not to play tricks with the coaches. Percy went off to the yard. He felt very silly. On the way, he met James. Hello, Percy. So you found a scarf, eh? But legs go in trousers, not funnels. And he puffed away to tell Henry the news. That evening, Thomas and Percy were resting in the shed. Percy's driver had taken away the trousers and given Percy a good rubdown. Firelighters promised to come early tomorrow, said Thomas. Henry arrived. He'd enjoyed taking the visitors around and now felt sorry for Percy, too. Driver says the weather will be warmer tomorrow. You won't need a scarf, Percy. Certainly not, replied Percy. Engines don't need scarves. Engines need warm boilers. Everyone knows that. Every summer, the island of Sodor is very busy. Holiday makers love to sightsee, and when the weather is fine, there is no better place to visit. Some people like to go to the mountains. Others like the valleys. Children love the seaside. One morning, Thomas was puffing along the line that runs by the coast. His two coaches, Annie and Clarabelle, were packed with children going to the beach. 
everyone was happy. Percy was taking some freight cars to the harbor. Hello, Thomas. You look cheerful. I wish I could take children today instead of freight cars. They're the Vicar's Sunday School, explained Thomas. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take the children home. Of course I will, promised Percy. Later, Percy saw Harold. Sorry, Percy. Can't talk. I'm on high alert. Why? Bad weather's due. My help's always needed. Mind how you go, Percy. <laughs> huffed Percy. As long as I've got rails to run on, I can go anywhere, in any weather, anyhow. Goodbye. Be careful, warned Edward. There's a storm coming. A promise is a promise, thought Percy, no matter what the weather. The children had a lovely day, but by tea time, dark clouds loomed ahead. Annie and Clarabelle were glad when Percy arrived. He was just in time. The rain streamed down Percy's boiler. Ugh, he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Percy struggled on past coastal villages and into the countryside. The river was rising fast. I wish I could see, I wish I could see, complained Percy as he battled against the rain. More trouble lay ahead. hissed Percy. The water is sloshing my fire. Percy's driver and fireman had to find some more firewood. I'll have some of your floorboards, please, said the fireman to the conductor. I only swept the floor this morning, grumbled the conductor, but he still helped. Soon Percy's fire was burning well. He felt warm and comfortable again. Then he saw Harold. Oh dear, thought Percy. Harold's come to laugh at me. Something thudded onto Percy's boiler. Ow! exclaimed Percy. He needn't throw things. It's a parachute, laughed his driver. Harold's dropping hot drinks for us. Thank you, Harold, whistled Percy. Good to be of service, replied Harold and buzzed away. The water lapped Percy's wheels. Percy was losing steam again, but he plunged bravely on. I promised, he panted. I promised. He made one more big effort, and at last, exhausted but triumphant, he brought the train home. Well done, Percy, cheered Thomas. You kept your promise, despite everything. Sir Topham had arrived in Harold. First he thanked the men, then Percy. Harold told me you were a, a wizard. He said he can beat you at some things, but not at being a submarine. I don't know what you two get up to sometimes, but I do know that you're a really useful engine. Oh, sir, whispered Percy happily. The island of Sodor had many visitors, and Sir Topham Hatt had scheduled more trains. Gordon, the big engine, had to work harder than ever before. Come on, he called to the coaches. Come on, come on, come on. The passengers rely on me to be on time. Whenever Gordon finished one journey, it was time for another to begin. Never mind, he puffed. I like a long run to stretch my wheels. Even so, Sir Topham Hatt decided that Gordon needed a rest. James shall do your work, he said kindly. 
James was delighted. He liked to show off his smart red paint and was determined to be as fast as Gordon. You know, little Toby, he boasted, I'm an important engine. Everyone knows it. I'm as regular as clockwork. Never late, always on time. That's me. Says you, replied Toby. Just then, Sir Topham had arrived. Your parts are worn, Toby, so you must go to the works to be mended. Can I take Henrietta, sir? No, what would the passengers do without her? Toby saw Percy by the water tower. Don't worry, Toby. I'll take care of Henrietta until you get back. Soon Toby was out on the main line. He clanked as he trundled along. He's a little engine with small wheels. His tanks don't hold much water. He had come a long way and began to feel thirsty. In the distance was a signal. Good, he thought. There's a station ahead. I can have a nice drink and a rest until James has passed. Toby was enjoying his drink when the signalman came up. He had never seen Toby before. Toby's driver tried to explain, but the new signalman wouldn't listen. We must clear the line for James with the express. You'll have to get more water at the next station. Hurrying used a lot of water and his tanks were soon empty. Poor Toby was out of steam and stranded on the main line. We must warn James, said the fireman. Then he saw Percy and Henrietta. Please, take me back to the station. It's an emergency. Henrietta hated leaving Toby. Never mind, said Percy. You're taking the fireman to warn James. That's a big help. Henrietta felt much better. James was fuming when he heard the news. I'm going to be late. My fault, said the signalman. I didn't understand about Toby. Now, James, said his driver, you'll have to push Toby. What, me? snorted James. Me? Push Toby and pull my train too? Grumbling dreadfully, James set off to find Toby. He came up behind Toby and gave him a bump. Get on, you. James had to work very hard. When he reached the workstation, he felt exhausted. Some children were on the platform. Coo! The express is late, and it's got two engines. I think James couldn't pull it on his own, so Toby had to help him. Never mind, James, whispered Toby. They're only joking. <laughs> said James. Toby just smiled. It was an important day in the yard. Everyone was busy and excited, making notes and taking photographs. A special visitor had arrived and was now the center of attention. Who is that? whispered Thomas to Duck. That, said Duck proudly, is a celebrity. A what? asked Percy. A celebrity is a very famous engine, replied Duck. Driver says we can talk to him soon. Oh, said Thomas, he's probably too famous to even notice us. Just then, Gordon arrived. Puh, said Gordon, who cares? A lot of fuss about nothing, if you ask me. And he steamed away. Later that night, the engines found that the visitor wasn't conceited at all. He enjoyed talking to the other engines till long after the stars came out. He left early next morning. Gordon was still complaining. Good riddance, he grumbled, chattering all night. Who is he anyway? Duck told you, replied Thomas, he's famous. As famous as me? Nonsense. He's famouser than you. He went a hundred miles an hour before you were even thought of. 
Huh, so he says, huffed Gordon. But I didn't like his looks. He's got no dome. Never trust domeless engines. They're not respectable. I never boast, but I'd say a hundred miles an hour would be easy for me. Goodbye. Duck took some freight cars to Edward's station. Hello, called Edward. That famous engine came through this morning. He whistled to me. Wasn't he kind? He's the finest engine in the world, replied Duck. Then he told Edward what Gordon had said. Take no notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. He thinks no engine should be famous but him. Look, he's coming now. Gordon was running very fast. His wheels pounded the rails. He did it, I'll do it. He did it, I'll do it. Gordon's train rocketed past and was gone. He'll knock himself to bits, chuckled Duck. Gordon's driver eased him off. Steady, Gordon. We aren't running a race. We are, then, said Gordon, but he said it to himself. Suddenly, Gordon began to feel a little strange. The top of my boiler seems funny, he thought. It feels as if something is loose. I'd better go slower. But it was too late. On the viaduct, they met the wind. It was a teasing wind which blew suddenly in hard puffs. Gordon thought it wanted to push him off the bridge. No, you don't, he said firmly. But the wind had other ideas. It curled round his boiler, crept under his loose dome, and lifted it off and away into the valley below. Gordon was most uncomfortable. The cold wind was whistling through the hole where his dome should be, and he felt silly without it. At the big station, the freight cars laughed at him. Gordon tried to wish them away. But they crowded around no matter what he did. On the way back to the shed, he wanted his driver to stop and fetch his dome. We'll never find it now, said the driver. You'll have to go to the works for a new one. Gordon was very cross. I hope the shed is empty tonight, he huffed to himself. But all the engines were there waiting. Never trust domeless engines, said a voice from somewhere behind him. They aren't respectable. Duck, the great western engine, worked hard in the yard at the big station. Sometimes he pulled coaches. Sometimes he pushed freight cars. But whatever the work, Duck got the job done without fuss. One day, Duck was resting in the shed when Sir Topham had arrived. Your work in the yard has been good. Would you like to have a branch line for your own? Yes, please, sir, replied Duck. So Duck took charge of his new branch line. The responsibility delighted him. The line runs along the coast by sandy beaches till it meets a port where big ships come in. Duck enjoyed exploring every curve and corner of the line. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. Soon, Duck was busier than ever. Sir Topham Hatt was building a new station at the port. Duck pulled the heavy freight cars wherever they were needed. Bertie looked after Duck's passengers and the other engines helped too, but the work took a long time. Noise and dust filled the air. Don't worry, whistled Toby, the station's nearly finished. And on time, too, said Duck, thankfully.
Duck felt his responsibility deeply and talked endlessly about it. You don't understand, Donald, how much Sir Topham Hatt relies on me. Ach, ay, muttered Donald sleepily. I'm Great Western, and I... Quack, quack, quack. What? Ye heard? Quack, quack, ye go. Sounds like ye'd an egg laid. Now wheesht and let an engine sleep. Quack yourself, said Duck indignantly. Later, he spoke to his driver. Donald says I quack as if I'd laid an egg. Quack, do you? pondered his fireman. He whispered something to Duck and his driver. They were going to play a joke on Donald and pay him back for teasing Duck. The engines were busy for the rest of the day and nothing more was said. Not even a quack. But when at last Donald was asleep, Duck's driver and fireman popped something into his water tank. Next morning, when Donald stopped for water, he found that he had an unexpected passenger aboard. A small white duckling popped out of his water tank. Now, do, who's behind this? laughed Donald. The duckling was tame. She shared the fireman's sandwiches and rode in the tender. The other engines enjoyed teasing Donald about her. Presently, she grew tired of traveling and hopped off at a station, and there she stayed. That night, Donald's driver and fireman got busy. And in the morning, when Duck's crew arrived to look him over, they laughed and laughed. Look, Duck, look what's under your bunker. It's a nest box with an egg in it. Donald opened a sleepy eye. Well, 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 ye must have laid it in the night, Duck, all unbeknownst. Then Duck laughed, too. You win, Donald. It'd take a clever engine to get the better of you. There's a pond near the duckling station. Here she often swims and welcomes the trains as they pass by. The station master calls her Dilly, but to everyone else, she is always Donald's duck. Every afternoon, Thomas the tank engine puffs along his branch line with Annie and Clarabel. First, they pass the water mill. Next, they come to a big farm. Then, they can see a bridge with a village nestled either side of it. This is a special place. Whenever children hear Thomas coming along, they stand on the bridge waving until he is out of sight. One day, Thomas was running late. He had stopped at the signal before the bridge to talk to some new children. Percy the green engine was waiting too. Hurry up, Thomas, called Percy when the signal dropped. If you're late, Sir Topham Hatt may get a new engine to replace you. He would never do that, thought Thomas, but he was worried. Next day, Thomas hurried along the line. Just ahead was the goods yard. There, on the platform, was an inspector waving a red flag. Next, Thomas saw some children. They were waving, too. Something must be wrong, thought Thomas. This station is for goods, not passengers. Help, Thomas, help. We're glad to see you, called the children. Please, will you take us home? The station master explained to Thomas's driver that the school bus had broken down and all the parents would be worried if the children were late. Thomas waited as the children walked down from the bridge. Then he took the children to the next station where Bertie was waiting to take them home. When Thomas finished his journey, he was very late. He was worried that Sir Topham Hatt might be cross with him. I warned Thomas, puffed Percy to James. He's been late one time too many. He'll be in trouble now. But next morning, when Thomas picked up his passengers, Sir Topham Hatt was nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness, sighed Thomas.
Thomas knows every part of his branch line. Just ahead was a stretch where the hot sun had bent the rails on the track. Careful, Thomas, called his driver, but it was too late. That's done it, said his driver. We shan't get any further today. But what about my passengers, asked Thomas. Don't worry, they'll be looked after, replied his driver. While workmen repaired the line, Thomas had to shunt freight cars in the yard. Bertie came to see him. I understand you need my help again. Yes, Bertie, replied Thomas sadly. I can't run without my rails. Bertie set off to collect Thomas's passengers. Hello, Bertie, they said. We're glad you're here. Bertie drove along the road that runs by the railway. He stopped at each station along the line. Sometimes he stopped between stations to let people off closer to their homes. Thomas felt miserable. I've lost my passengers to Bertie. They'll like him better than me. Sir Topham had arrived. Your branch line is repaired. I'm going to change your timetable so that you and Bertie can work together more. When Thomas reached the station, there to his relief were all his passengers. Bertie is a good bus, but we missed our train rides with you, they said. Later, Thomas spoke to Bertie. Thank you for looking after my passengers. That's all right, Thomas. I like to make new friends, but I'm glad to share them with you. You're a good friend indeed, replied Thomas, and always will be. Thomas and Percy are good friends, but sometimes Percy teases Thomas about being frightened, and he doesn't like that at all. One evening, he was dozing happily, but Percy wanted to talk. Wake up, Thomas. Are you dreaming about the time you thought I was a ghost? Certainly not. Anyway, I was only pretending to be scared. I knew it was you, really. Percy went on teasing him. I hope the guard leaves the light on for you tonight. Why? asked Thomas. I quite like the dark. Oh, really? exclaimed Percy. I am surprised. I always thought you were afraid of the dark. I wonder why. Thomas decided to say nothing and went to sleep instead. Next day, Sir Topham Hatt came to see him. I would like you to go to the harbor tonight. You have to collect something rather unusual. What sort of something? asked Thomas. Wait and see, replied Sir Topham Hatt. Meanwhile, Percy was moving freight cars into a siding. Henry arrived with his goods train. The signalman changed the switches and Percy waited on the siding until Henry had steamed by. Then there was trouble. The switches are jammed, called the signalman. I can't switch them back for Percy. The workmen will have to mend them in the morning. It's too late now. Hmm, said Percy's driver. I'm sorry, Percy, but you'll have to stay here for the night. Where are you going? asked Percy. Home for tea, replied the fireman. Percy was speechless. He watched as the other engines went home to the shed. Nighttime came and Percy began to feel very lonely. Oh dear, he murmured, it's very dark. Oh, oh, what's that? It was only an owl, but Percy didn't realize this. Oh, I wish Thomas were here too, he sighed. Thomas was waiting for his mysterious load at the harbor. Suddenly, there it was. Cinders and ashes, cried Thomas. It's a dragon. Don't worry, laughed his driver. This dragon is made of paper. It's for the carnival tomorrow. Workmen lifted the dragon onto Thomas's low loader and put lights all round it for protection. Then Thomas set off into the misty night. Percy was asleep on his siding and had no idea that Thomas was approaching him.
Percy woke up with a start. Help! cried Percy. I'm not going to open my eyes until my driver comes. Next morning, the switches were mended and Percy puffed back to the junction. Gordon was just about to leave with the express. You'll never guess what I saw last night. Gordon was in no mood for puzzles. I'm a busy engine. I don't have time for your games. I've seen a huge dragon. It was covered in lights. Gordon snorted. You've been in the sun too long. Your dome has cracked. When the other engines heard the news, they laughed too. Look out, Percy, chuckled James, or the dragon may gobble you up. No one believes me, huffed Percy. Maybe I did imagine the dragon after all. But Percy soon found out that he hadn't. Help! Save me! cried Percy. It's all right, whistled Thomas, and he explained about the carnival. By the way, how was your night out? Percy decided to tell Thomas the truth. Well, Percy, said Thomas, maybe we do get scared sometimes, but if we're not afraid to tell each other, then that means we're quite brave, too. <laughs> <laughs>